hello, my name is Latif Daly. I'm um, Director of Europe and Middle East Operations for Ares Software. Uh, Ares Software is a company that's been around since 1992. We make a product called Prism G2, which is used globally and um, also we used it on quite a few mega projects here in the UK. So today I'm going to be talking about an overview uh, of how Prism has been used to integrate uh, project controls to deliver some of the UK's largest uh, mega projects. So to start off with, Prism is a lifecycle management tool. It's meant to incorporate all the different uh, data that you need to manage and deliver a project successfully. And if we look at the heart and soul of Prism, it's the cost management module. Uh, this is where you're going to do all the time phasing of your budgets and your forecast. You're going to bring in your basis of estimate to build up your original baseline, uh, your original uh, performance measure and baseline. You'll do your schedule integration, so bring in your start and finish states from P6 or Microsoft uh, project to get the time phasing uh, aligned. You'll bring in all your accounting data, commitments, risk data, funding, and then do all of your change management uh, and analysis and reporting out of this module. Uh, next, we have the estimating uh, module. And this is actually powered by a product called CostOS. And this is where you do your bottoms up or top down estimate. You can bring in 2D drawings, 3D models, uh, use parametric assemblies to price everything up. And then once you have your estimate uh, finalized and you, you go out and you win the scope of work, then you pull the details of your estimate into your cost management platform to then create your, uh, your original baseline and have traceability from that original baseline to the details of the original estimate. Uh, we then have an engineering module, which if, you, if you've ever worked with uh, Bechtel or US, they have something called um, EPPR, which is your Engineering Performance and Pro Productivity Reporting. Uh, this is where you're, you're defining uh, rules of credit for your engineering deliverables and loading all these up into the system. And then as you progress these deliverables, you have defined percent completes at each stage so that you get common, consistent um, progressing of engineering deliverables. This is mainly used to track hours and quantities and you get all of your uh, productivity reporting out of here and then these engineering uh, deliverables are then linked to the control accounts in your cost management platform so that you get a physical percent complete driving uh, your progress in your cost management platform. We also have the current module where you can track purchase orders, do shipment expediting, um, track all your materials and equipment and again link all of these to the, to the control accounts. You have traceability as to which uh, purchase orders related to which control accounts. We have a contracts module. You can track all of your contract award values, um, compensation events, uh, any sort of changes to the contract, and also do your bid comparisons. And again, the pay items of the contract are linked to the control accounts in your cost management platform. And we have a construction module, which is very similar to the engineering module, but instead of tracking engineering deliverables, you're tracking quantities installed versus planned quantity. So you're getting a physical percent complete uh, based off of your construction field activities, as opposed to a construction manager saying, I'm roughly 60%. It's, you no, know, if you've installed five out of 10, you're 50% complete. So you get the physical progress on your, engineering or on your construction deliverables, then feeding into the cost management platform. With regards to interfaces, we have direct interface with P6, a Microsoft project. So we bring all that schedule logic into, into the cost management platform and then time phase everything accordingly. Uh, we integrate with accounting systems. So we'll integrate with ERP systems such as Oracle, SAP, Coins, and bring all of your actual invoiced amounts into the tool and then do accruals up or down to get to the actual cost work performed or cost work done. And then we have an integration engine where we can actually link to various different third-party applications, define the rules and how we're going to exchange data between Prism and those applications, and automate the exchange of those data on, on regular schedules as defined by, by our clients. Now, all of this is brought together with project reporting. So in Prism, you can set up standalone individual projects, and you can have multiple Prism projects that all have different coding structures, different calendars, different currencies, and you can define different teams that have access to each of these different projects. But then we also have something, a layer on top of that called enterprise reporting, where each of these individual projects that you set up can be mapped to a common enterprise structure, and then at the enterprise level, you can, you can uh, track and report progress in a common existent fashion across your entire portfolio of projects and see how all of your programs are, are performing. And then with regards to reporting, the last piece of reporting is, is, is our Tableau dashboards. So we have Tableau dashboards embedded within Prism, and we have a data warehouse that sits on top of Prism that captures snapshots of all the Prism data, pushes it through to the Tableau dashboards, and allows you to do both uh, real-time reporting and historical reporting on all of your data. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, we have a data warehouse. This data warehouse takes snapshots of everything uh, and stores all the data every single period. We've now gotten into remote hosting access, so Prism traditionally has been installed on-premise with clients, but a lot of clients now wanted uh, cloud-based functionality, so we, provide, uh, we have several different hosting partners that we use to uh, provide that functionality via the web. And then we also have a recently added document management system. So we actually partnered with a third-party uh, document management platform, and we're now in the process of embedding that within Prism so that we can handle the document management as well. 
Um, it, one thing to note is any of these modules that I've just identified, you can use the PRISM modules or you can use your own modules and we can still do the integration between your modules and PRISM and bring that data in to consolidate it all into one place. Uh, if you look at the global presence of, of, of uh, PRISM across all industries, people always ask, well, what, what industry does PRISM lend itself to? And if you look at it, we've got many clients in infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure has actually recently been one of our largest uh, markets. Nuclear energy also has been another huge one for us recently. Uh, quite a few clients uh, in, in that region. Oil and, oil and gas used to be one of our largest. Uh, with the drop in, uh, in, in oil prices, it's kind of slowed down a little bit, but there's still a couple of clients that are going pretty strong with implementations right now. Uh, we have mining and metals, uh, EPC firms, uh, Chioda actually being one of our largest clients. They're a Japanese EPC firm that has about 3,000 users of PRISM, and they're managing 2,100 projects around the globe. And that's only 30% of the rollout. They're still looking to do uh, another 70% across the, their organization. And they're managing everything from small million dollar or million pound projects to multi billion pound projects. Uh, we have government projects such as JPL and NASA and Los Alamos National Labs, and then also technology projects. Where, uh, for Microsoft, we actually just recently won a project with them where we're doing in, uh, helping them manage the delivery of 200 data centers around the world. <clears throat> uh, if we look at the history of PRISM within the UK, our first client back in 2009 was LOWR. We did an implementation for them and got them up and running with PRISM. Uh, soon after that, we went and did an implementation for Sellafield. And on Sellafield, we're actually, PRISM is being used to manage 150 years with the scope. Uh, and they're integrated with something like 30,000 schedule activities. Uh, Crossrail was in a, a big win for us, which uh, was one of the most uh, high profile projects that we got on in the UK and kind of the one that kicked off a lot of other uh, projects for us. Uh, then we went on to do Transfer for London. We have about seven billion worth of scope going through Transfer for London. Uh, off the success of the rail that we had, HS2 then came to us and said, can you do the same thing for us? And they brought us on to do an implementation of both the estimating platform and the cost management platform. So we're currently in the process of getting them up and running. And then most recently, we just added Horizon Nuclear to the list, where we uh, just signed them on contract October 1st, and we're looking to have them live uh, in, in, in December 1st, I believe it is. So very quick to implement. Uh, we also have quite a few JVs in the UK who are using PRISM. So we have JVs who are supporting HS2, supporting TFL's North Line Extension, uh, Network Rail, Stafford Area Improvement Project, and uh, the Tideway Project. And if you look at part of the reason why PRISM has been so successful, uh, it's because it's, it's an out-of-the-box solution and it's quick to implement. It's not something that you have to actually, um, you have to actually uh, define and, and build and develop. Uh, it's out of the box, so when you turn it on, you simply configure it for how you want to use it, which means we can do very quick implementations. So on a large-scale program, multi, we're talking multi-billion pounds, we can generally get a client up running in 8 to 12 weeks, which means you can pretty much hit the ground running. <clears throat> what this allows is now you're able to get user engagement early on and up front. And because of that, you're able to get a quicker route to quality data, you're able to de decrease the amount of bad legacy data that your project's tracking and, 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 and struggling with trying to balance out. You're able to benefit from upgrades and enhancements because we're not customizing the solution differently for each individual client. It's a standard product. Everyone is getting the same version of it. You know that all versions of it are being tested and that the functionality you're using isn't a standalone customized uh, version that hasn't been tested by somebody. Uh, and, and this means that clients are now self-sustainable and, and less costly and better value for money. You're not having to bring in uh, expensive designers and developers to come in and redesign the, the software every time you want to change something. You're able to benefit from the enhancements that other clients have taken on board. <coughs> Um, so this is unlike other solutions where you see uh, lots of other, other products are very customized design solutions. We have to actually have to define how it's going to work and how the tables and calculations are going are to perform. And you see these, these solutions generally take years to implement. Um, so quite a contrast compared to the, the quick uh, path to success that PRISM provides. Now if you look at system integration, uh, one of the benefits of PRISM is that the, the way we do it is that the first thing you do in PRISM is you define your integrated coding structure. Once you have this integrated coding structure within PRISM, it then gives you the ability to, uh, to provide traceability between your original baseline estimate, your cost and progress data, your schedule data, and your contracts data. Now to create this integrated coding structure, what we do is we first look at what is the structure of your estimate? How are you, how are you building up or pricing up the work packages within your estimate? What's the structure you're using for that? We'll then look at what are your cost and reporting requirements. And this isn't just how are you tracking actuals within your, your ERP system, but how are you going to actually deliver the work? And do you have a person responsible at each level of the hierarchy? We'll look at how you're packaging the schedule and how you're packaging the activities within your schedule. <coughs> and then we'll also look at how are you packaging your contracts and awarding your contracts, and what are the pay items that you're actually awarding to your subcontractors. 
Now what we find is that most of the times these different disciplines tend to work in their own silo and do their own thing. And they tend to come up with their own coding structures. And they don't always talk to each other. And that's where a lot of the problems come when you're trying to manage uh, very complex or large projects. So what we try to do is we try to get uh, key stakeholders from each of these disciplines around a table to all talk about what's the common structure that's going to work for everybody. And how can we get all the systems aligned so we can bring all of this data together. Um, sometimes you can get a nice structure in place that, that aligns with everybody, sometimes you can't. Sometimes, sometimes you have to make a bit of a compromise. But the concept is still the same. What you're going to do is you're going to try to look within these structures and find a common integration point across all the structures. And that common integration point then becomes your control account within PRISM. And that, and that control account becomes the point that you load all the data into your single source database. And that structure also becomes the backbone of your project. So once you have that structure to find it in place, you mandate that everybody in every system from document management to your scope book is all going to align with that structure. So achieving cost schedule integration. The, the way we achieve this within PRISM is that on day one, you're going to build up an original baseline estimate, and you're going to price this up. And if you're using cost costs, you can probably build it up in, in cost costs and price it up there. If you have your own estimating tool, you can do it in that as well. Some people use Excel even. But you'll price, everything, price up the original baseline estimate, you're then going to put together an original program, and this is going to be your complete uh, schedule in P6 or Microsoft Project. You'll then integrate the two and map them against control accounts within PRISM, and load all the detail against those control accounts so you have the traceability as to where the values against your control accounts came from. And then within PRISM, you're now able to produce all of your cost, progress, and performance reports, and also produce all of your time phase profiles out of a single source of truth. <clears throat> so now you're using the right tool for the right job. You're using the, schedule, or the estimating software for what it's intended for, which is to price up your original estimate. You're using the schedule software for what it's intended for, which is to build your schedule logic and do your critical path analysis. And you're using PRISM to integrate the two and bring it all together. So now you're getting true integration of your disciplines. You're getting clear traceability between the different uh, disciplines and the different data sets. <clears throat> you're able to eliminate the need for cost-loaded schedules and eliminate the pain of having to cost-load your schedules because now you simply use the schedule for the schedule logic and use PRISM for all the time phase of the cost data. And you're able to get a single point of truth now. And you have all reports and all, all progress and performance reports coming out of one place. <clears throat> so now, within PRISM, you're able to generate your time phase uh, budgets Generate your actual, your, your, your to-date actuals, uh, to-date earned value, and then be able to see what is your date, what are your, your to-date variances? How is your project performing based on the schedule? <clears throat> also, your to-date cost variances. How is your project performing versus, uh, versus what it spent versus what it earned? And then ultimately, your variance at complete. What is the difference between your budget at complete and your total out during cost? To see where the project's going to end up at the end of the day. And you can get all this out of Prism now. So if you look at PRISM, there's various different methods for progressing control accounts within PRISM. Um, with, as I mentioned, in the cost management module, we have control accounts. And that's kind of the, the touch point where your cost, schedule, and scope all come together. But then as far as progressing the, these uh, control accounts, one way that you can do it is you can bring in your schedule activities. And you can progress your detailed schedule activities, map and weight those activities against your control account, and use those schedule activities to drive the percent complete on the control account. Another method is use your, use your engineering deliverables. So in the engineering module, you define all the deliverables, and as you progress those detailed deliverables, you track your quantities and hours, you assess your productivity, and get a physical percent complete from the engineering module, and use that to progress your control accounts. Another method is you use your procurement and contracts data. So as you, as you purchase, items, or purchase items, and uh, as your pay items on your contract get progressed, you could use that to also progress your control accounts and get a, get a physical percent, percent complete. And then the other most common one is, is construction quantities installed. So using the construction field management module, as you track your quantities installed versus your planned quantity and you get the physical percent complete, you can then use that to also drive the percent complete on your control account. So now you have a basis for how you get the percent complete and your earned value gets your control accounts. So on, under the importance of managing change, so one of the most important things on a project is, is, is managing change. If you've ever taken a project management course, many of you may have seen this picture before. And I don't know if you can read that, but the little dinghy in there is original contract, and the big boat is change order. So it really drives home the importance of managing change on a project. And most projects will either make or break themselves on how successful they are managing change. Uh, when we first did implementation on, on Crossrail, Crossrail was doing about 600 to 1,000 changes a period. So an enormous amount of change. Uh, and, and originally, we were doing it all in Excel spreadsheets. And I think we had like something like 176 Excel spreadsheets to manage change across every different contractor. Um, what we did in PRISM is we actually came in and built in something called an advanced change management module. We, we now track, track and manage all of the changes directly in PRISM and do it all electronically. So how does PRISM manage change? 
Well, first off, on day one, you're going to load in your original baseline estimate. You're going to link that with your original program, you're going to time phase that, and you're going to lock it in place and never touch it again. But once you've done that, you'll then also hit calculate, and you'll calculate a performance budget and a forecast equal to that original baseline estimate. So now you have complete traceability as to where your, your, your budget and your forecast values came from. In addition, we also added the ability to calculate a financial budget or investment authority off of that original baseline estimate. So that you have traceability as to where that came from as well. Now within PRISM, we have the change management module. Every period, you'll have approved changes that come in, and the sum of the original budget plus the approved budget changes will give you the new budget you're reporting against. The sum of your original forecast plus your forecast changes will give you the new forecast you're reporting against. And the same thing on the, on the, on the financial budget. And this data gets tracked and stored in, in PRISM every period. And you can't go back and change history. You can't go back and say, well, last six months ago I said this was 100K, I want to go back and change it to 150. All changes are made in the current period going forward, so you don't change your historical performance data. So what this allows you to achieve now is to have bank statement style of, of reporting, where you actually have complete peer-to-peer -peer traceability. So you can always go in PRISM and see what was my original baseline, the original budget forecast and funding amount. Then every period, what changes came in that period? And what was the cost impact of each of those changes against the budget forecast and the funding amounts? And the value at, at the end of the period should tie it with your change management register, or with your change register. So you should be able to look at the change register and see totals in there, and that should tie to what you've reported on your period of report. So complete traceability between the two. And you'll have that every period from the start of the program all the way up to the current period that you're in. Uh, we've also set up the ability to have a change approval hierarchy. So in PRISM, you can, you'll, you'll, you'll generally have, on, on most projects, you'll generally have cost engineers. And those are generally the people that initiate the change, re the change record. Above them will be some layer of project managers. Above them, some layer of uh, senior management. Uh, then some layer of directors. And then ultimately, a board or program director at the top. What PRISM allows you to do is to identify all these individuals as reviewers and approvers and assign them to their relative uh, control accounts. So you define who the owners of the control accounts are. Then you can give them all varying levels of approval authority. So they can have different levels of authority over budget versus forecast versus funding. And then as your change records come in, depending on the value of the change record and the control accounts that that change record is impacting, will determine how that change record routes to the system for review and approval. So now because we are able to assign ownership of accounts, another thing that we're able to do is generally a lot of people do in PRISM is they'll set up something called control account types. And the control account types that we see pretty often will be target or scope delivery accounts, contingency accounts, and risk accounts. Now there's, there's generally a lot more account types that people will generally set up, but these three for, for uh, as an example will kind of help me demonstrate this, this concept here. All of these account types within PRISM will have a, have a performance budget, a forecast, and a financial budget or investment authority associated with them. Now because we can assign ownership of these accounts and ownership over the cost types against these accounts, we can then say delivery teams and managers will own the performance budget and the forecast on the, on the target and scope accounts. So they can make whatever changes they want to the budget and forecast within their levels of, of uh, approval authority. We can then give senior managers and directors ownership of the contingency accounts. So now if the delivery team needs to draw down from contingency, they can approve their side of the transaction, but they have to get the senior management and directors to approve the opposite side of the transaction before that goes through and impacts the totals in PRISM. We also on some of our clients saw where, where clients were doing risk assessments every quarter. And one of our clients was actually doing, uh, I think it was every quarter they did a risk assessment, and it was taking three to four weeks to go through, I think about 3,000 change records and try to figure out which ones related to the risk register and which ones didn't, and then figure out what adjustments they needed to make to the risk register to balance their data out. So to solve this problem, what we did is we created risk control accounts within PRISM. We loaded the risk register against these risk control accounts and then gave the risk team ownership of these risk control accounts. So now if a risk occurred on site, the delivery teams and managers could put the actual impact of that risk against the target scope delivery account, and the risk team had to approve the opposite, uh, the corresponding transaction, offsetting the risk register. So now instead of doing a, at the end of three months, doing a massive three to four week exercise trying to uh, make sense of all this, the risk team was now involved in the day-to-day -day transactions of, of, um, of a, a review and improving these changes and making sure they're accurate and correct. And they, uh, on this particular project, they actually assigned a risk person to every, um, every delivery team and they actually sat around the table reviewing the changes with them every week or two. The other piece that we tackled was, was the, the finance team. So finance tra tra tracks a slightly different budget than your performance budget. So what we did is we actually gave ownership of the finance team gave them ownership of all control accounts when it came to the financial budget. So now the delivery teams can make their budget and um, forecast updates as needed, but if they needed investment authority or funding adjustments, the finance team had to review and approve that. 
And the finance team did the same thing. They actually signed a project accountant to every delivery team. And that project accountant sits now in that, around that table reviewing the, the changes every week. And what we found is that now you had these teams working much more as an integrated, uh, working much more integrated than before. And they weren't off doing their own things. And they had more agreement as to what the, what the actual numbers were. Everyone understood the budget, forecast, and funding uh, numbers. So one other thing we've done is, is, as I mentioned, we had a data warehouse. So we, we've, we've added a data warehouse to the software. So the data warehouse now allows us to take snapshots of the data every period. So we can go back and, um, and actually review historical snapshots. Uh, we actually learned this from Crosswell and a couple other clients where they spent a lot of money developing um, data warehouses to track everything and to store all the data. So we actually now provide this on top of Prism. And we can take snapshots of all the Prism data. We also have the ability for clients who want to have, uh, who track custom data that's not stored in, traditionally stored in PRISM, like say they want to track health and safety data or specific uh, performance metrics. We can build custom data entry forms and allow clients to enter this data every period and push that into the data warehouse so that they can now have that data stored and used for reporting. And then on top of that, we've added an integration engine now. And the integration engine actually provides the, the capability to link PRISM to third-party applications. Once we link PRISM to those third-party applications, we can then do field-to-field -field mapping within those applications and define the rules and how the data is going to get transformed and transferred from one application to the next. Uh, and you can do bilateral exchange of data, so it can go either way. We also can define customized workflows. So we can actually define a workflow around how the data is going to get exchanged and, and add email integration or data validation checks on the data before it gets passed from one system to the other. So now what this integration engine allows us to do is to bring third-party data into the data warehouse and store it in the data warehouse. Um, one of the things we have going on right now is, is, is for one of our clients, HS2, is actually putting in, pl put in place a synchronized WBS structure. So we're going to use the integration engine. Um, they've actually uh, developed a master WBS asset register that they've defined. That asset register is going to get pushed into our integration engine. And the integration engine is then going to ensure that all the applications, PRISM for the cost management, uh, cost us for the estimating, uh, P6 for the schedule, SAP for the ERP, CMAR for the contracts, and Zactium for the risk. It'll ensure that all those applications have the same WBS structure. And if you want to make a change to the WBS structure, you have to submit that for review and approval before it goes through. And if somebody goes into an application and creates a WBS structure that doesn't exist, it'll flag it up and say, this is an invalid WBS structure. So it'll mandate that all, the, all these systems are kind of all aligned and the entire program is using the same structure. Um, also within a lot of these applications, we're going to be integrating and pushing data back and forth between these applications so that we get everything synced up. Um, so now, because you have a, a standard WBS structure and a standard control account structure that everyone's following and, and everyone's seeing to the same hymn sheet, you have common, a common coding structure throughout. So now your estimate package, your estimators will actually price according to the structure. Once the estimate's done, that'll then be issued out as RFPs to your contractors by the same structure. You'll then award to your contractors, and you'll award the pay items based on that, on that same structure. You'll then track, measure, and report on your progress and performance based on the same structure. Receive your invoices and actuals on the same structure. And ultimately, make, monitor and make payments on the same structure. So you get complete traceability throughout the life cycle of the project from one system to the next, one application to the next and you're not getting disconnects from one system to another. Another thing we're doing with the integration engine is um, a lot of clients have come to us and said, how do we get client and subcontractor data more closely firmed up? You know, we don't want to be exchanging large Excel files between each other and trying to make sense of different versions of Excel files and dealing with data, data quality issues and, and different formats and whatnot. So one of the things we've introduced is um, web forms. Um, and these web forms will allow subcontractors to go in and enter the actuals, progress, and performance data, enter that onto a web form, on a PRISM web form, and then that data will then get pushed into a st client staging area, where the client can then review, amend, accept, or reject that data. And then from there, once they accept that data, it then pushes into their instance of PRISM. So now you're getting out of having to exchange Excel files between clients and exchange cumbersome files uh, and get a lot of this automated, start de defining validation checks in the data before it's pushed from one system to the next. Another approach is PRISM to PRISM. So in a lot of cases, some of the subcontractors now are looking at getting PRISM for the, for their, to manage their programs. And what this will allow is if the subcontractor has their own instance of PRISM, and the client has their own instance of PRISM, we can start doing PRISM to PRISM connections and direct feeds of that data. And we can actually give the, the, the subcontractors control over what data they push to the client, and give the client control over what data they're accepting from the subcontractor. So you can get much better integration there now. Um, another piece we're doing is uh, estimate and BIM integration. So we realized the importance of, 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 of getting people started on thinking about the structure early on when they're pricing up the original estimate. 
So we've actually implemented a, a prism estimator or, or cost us, which is what we use as our, as our estimating tool. <coughs> uh, this tool allows you to, to, to bring in BIM models and, and, and price everything up using parametric assemblies. You can also price using BIM models and drag and drop from the BIM model into your estimate to build all that data up. And you can do BIM, BIM to BIM comparisons to actually do, get your quantity and cost impact of accepting a new BIM model over another. Now we have this in the estimating platform. Then the next thing we're looking at doing now, we're talking to some of our clients about doing, is actually taking these BIM models now into the cost and progress module so that we can actually start progressing these BIM models and actually seeing color-coded changes in the BIM models as, as we progress forward. If you look at our reporting, uh, one of the key things behind any project is, is the quality of your reporting. Uh, Prism has quite a few standard reports. I mean, there's standard performance reports, which will give you period performance, to date performance, at complete performance. Uh, there's budget histogram and S-curves, which give you graphical representations of how the project's performing. You can see that on either an individual period basis or on a quarterly basis or an annual basis. Uh, performance bar chart and S-curve type reports, where you can see when you plan to do the work versus when you actually are forecasted or actually did the work. Uh, another one, which was, uh, we thought was going to be a one-off for Crossroads, is these flexible dynamic reports. And what these are are actually pivot tables. Uh, Crossroads said they wanted to see pivot tables. Um, this is actually a pivot table that's actually been linked to Prism. So you click on the Prism button in this table, it hit re it, uh, it, what it does is refreshes the data and pulls all the live data directly from Prism. And now what you have is a pivot table using live data from Prism where you can define the layout you want as your standard reports, save those reports as read-only, and then every time someone opens them, they get the exact same format. And now you can have all your performance data live, and as you make the changes in Prism, your performance data in these pivot tables is updated automatically. Uh, and people seem to like these quite a bit because you can add custom calculations, you can change the headers, and clients can also take copies of these pivot tables, make their own version of them, and do their own analysis off to the side. So these have quickly become one of our more popular reports. Uh, in a lot of these, we also do calculations where Generally, in these reports, your budget and forecast will be based off of change data, so that you have traceability as to how your budget and forecast totals were built up. Um, one of the other things we add in these reports is, is the ability to project your forecast based off your CPI, or do the, do the three different uh, calculations off of CPI and SPI to project a forecast, and then do the variance between the projected forecast and the forecast that you're actually reporting, so you can get an idea of how accurate your forecasting is, and know whether you need to go back and review your change data and maybe add something. Um, Another key, key uh, aspect of making a project successful is, is automated data validation. <clears throat> so one of the things we're doing with the integ integration engine is actually defining the feedback loops and defining how that data is going to be transferred from one system to the other and defining what are the exception and, and error reports that need to come out. What are the criteria that data needs to fit before it can push into another system or does it need to be kicked out? Another thing that we did is, is uh, another automated pivot table. And what this pivot table does is it actually takes a series of data validation checks, and these are data issues we've seen from one project to the next, where you may have negative forecasts to complete, you may have negative budgets, um, actuals for the period, but no earnings, earnings for the period, but no actual. And this report runs those checks against all of your data in Prism, live, you hit refresh on it. And then what it, re what it returns is all of the control accounts that have faded, failed a data quality check, tells you which data quality check they failed, and then tells you who the cost engineer or, or QS is who owns that data. So you know exactly the touch point is to go and fix that data before you produce your premium report. Uh, next one is plug and play dashboards. So because we have the integration engine, we have the data warehouse, so we're pushing all this data into this data warehouse, we're able to get um, very quick dashboards, gen generic dashboard layouts up and running for clients. Uh, we have predefined business intelligent objects, and we simply sit down with the client and get a, get a rough design together. We can generally have these up and running within uh, one to two weeks. So you get a quick win on dashboards, and you have something you can produce and show. Um, then if we get another couple of weeks, we can sit down and start doing storyboard format. We can do a much more thorough design and actually define a layout where on the screen you can scroll up and down and see your report, and you can also print that out on a piece of paper and take that directly to the meeting and review it. Um, and you can start bringing in different layouts and different formats of those storyboards and bringing in third-party data such as health and safety or risk data and seeing all the detail behind that. So now you have all your data coming from one source now. <clears throat> um, and lastly, partnering for success. No matter what system you use or how you structure or configure it, one of the key parts of getting those systems successful is getting the right teams in place to implement them and get the coding structures right and define your processes. Uh, our philosophy over, over at Aries has always been to, um, that our client's success is, is our success. You know, if we can make our clients successful and make you guys happy, your word of mouth will do more to sell the software than any, any sales rep cold calling people. Um, and that's just the way it's been, and that's part of the reason we've had so much success here is because we've, we've focused so much on making our clients successful and actually embedding people on the team to help define those procedures and talk to the lessons learned and the best practices. 
So, questions, comments? Yep. So we can we can do we can do both. Originally, uh, Prism was an on-premise uh, platform, so clients would install it on their own servers and then push it out themselves. Now, a lot of clients have come to us and said that they want cloud-based solutions. So we have several different hosting partners we use to actually push it out as a cloud-based solution now, and we give clients the option of doing either or. Some of our clients, such as some some of the nuclear clients and some of the Department of Defense clients, don't want their data out on the web and they don't want it in the cloud. They have security restrictions around that, so it's kind of nice to have the on-premise to allow them to own it. Uh, even some of our clients in the Middle East are very hesitant to put it on the web. So this gives us both options, gives, it gives us the flexibility. <clears throat> yep. um, do, you support, do you support also the use of mobile devices like uh, iPad, uh, iPhone for you know, data that needs to be captured on site maybe? Yeah, so we started doing that. So if we do a cloud-based solution, Generally, we can format those, and, and the Tableau dashboards can be formatted for uh, tablet devices, iPhones. Uh, we also, for our um, construction field progressing module, have introduced a, a, a mobile app for that. So you can update your quantities installed on that mobile app. Uh, and we have plans to do more of that. Um, that's becoming a pretty hot thing now. You talked about uh, creating bespoke forms. Yes. Um, do, so the information that's typed into those forms, uh, is the data warehouse able to capture that? That's question one. And the other is, if you're taking in uh, from an outside source system, uh, say there was a health and safety uh, data source somewhere, mm -hmm. can that information then sucked into the data warehouse that you Yes. Got? Yeah, okay. Yep, so with the data warehouse, there's multiple ways of bringing the data in. One is we can create those custom forms, and you can manually type the data in. And it gives you the ability to have an application to, to type in data, store that in the data warehouse, and then push that through to the business intelligence objects in the dashboards. Um, the other way is you can extract data from a system and put it in a location, and we can link directly to that file and pull that into the data warehouse and store that every period. Um, and then the other way, the ideal way, is to use the integration engine and connect directly to the application define the rules and how the data is going to be exchanged. That way you're not having to deal with manual, manual uh, uh, updates of the data or ex making sure the export's right. You can define all the rules ahead of time and define validation checks, define uh, reviewers and approvers for that so that the data is not just getting pushed randomly from one system to the other. So yeah. And that was the whole purpose of building the data warehouse so we could start capturing all this data. Yep. Any other questions? Latif, hi. Can uh, Prism integrate with any systems? Or is those systems are specific you work with? Using our integration engine, we can pretty much integrate with any system. We haven't with seen a system, system yet we can't integrate with. The only issues that we have sometimes is if the system sits behind a firewall, we may have to work with IT to get access to that firewall. But um, we pretty much don't implement, integrate with most anything so far, as long as we can get access to it. How about when you uh, go down to the level, for example, there is a trackman where we track the construction hours. Yep. Even to that low level, you can integrate. Yeah. So we actually have staffing plans in PRISM. We can bring in actual hours within the staffing plans within PRISM. Um, we have uh, one client who's actually, or a couple, I think a couple clients, who are actually using the staffing plan to actually project a forecast. Because as their staffing plan changes, they're actually calculating a new forecast based off of that. Because you have the ability to load rates and everything in PRISM and actually calculate forecast based off of that. You can also do profiling based off of those staffing plans. Yeah, so we bring all that in. And then um, once you have the data in there, if it's coded the right way, you can start running reports off of that and slicing and dicing it at the low level that you want to see. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, another one? Go ahead. From best practice, really, um, the system when it's applied in sort of an you know, environment of multiple projects and or even a ma major project one, what sort of the best scenario could it be? Would it be like sort of a dedicated person who manages the system there, or are you going to be aiding in sort of day-to-day -day sort of queries and possibilities of improvement of the system or designing little bits that it's still need to be dealt with with the development of the project from early stages to the latest complicated ones like when we reach the 
uh, health and safety files and all these things. That, so we need like sort of a regular advice. And will that be a person dedicated to this employed just to manage the system as a sort of a controller or a yeah. manager? So one thing we generally do when we do implementations for clients is we generally will identify a, a series of super users, people who we think are going to be able to pick up the system very fast. And we'll give them a bit more advanced training than a general user and teach them how to, how to control the system. Now there'll be multiple levels though because each project may have a super user that controls that project and they define the calendars for that project, they define the currencies for that project, they'll define the coding structures and each project can be different from each other. Now sometimes you'll set them up all the same and you'll have a standard template but they can vary sometimes because you may have a joint venture with somebody else and you have to use a different coding structure. Um, so you'll probably have a super user or a, team, a small team of super users that manage each project. Um, then at the enterprise level, over your entire organization, because you may be reporting across projects around the globe, um, or it could even just be a very large program where you're, you, you split the program into multiple prison projects. Uh, you may have different delivery partners delivering each project. Uh, you'll probably have a, a handful, like one or two super users at the enterprise level as well. And those will be people who can actually define the common coding for all project, projects. Um, some clients, we train them, they take over the system themselves and they run it themselves completely. Other clients that come back to us and said, we want one of your team embedded within our team to actually support us on an ongoing basis. So we have direct connection to you guys and we have a, a specialist as part of our team, embedded as part of our team, uh, helping us do our period and close and our period of reports. And we offer either our option for clients. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay, if any of you have any additional questions, um, there's my contact details, get in touch. If you want to see a, a more detailed presentation of, of the software, if you have questions about anything I presented here today, uh, let me know and I can, um, we can set something up. All right, thank you.